Hey everybody, and welcome back to History Student Reacts. Today, we're going to be watching His Year Cicero, 63 BC, by Historia Civilis. Uh, I'm really excited to get into this one, uh, into the next couple videos, because now we are reaching the uh, late Republican era, going into the early Imperial era, um, which is a time that I find really interesting. You know, we get figures like Cicero, Caesar, Cato, and then as we move into the Empire, you know, we get Octavian, um, Pompey, well, we get the, I mean, the Civil Wars. So there's a lot of uh, really interesting stuff coming up, a really eventful time in Roman history. Uh, I'm excited to get into it. Hope you guys are. So without any further ado, hey, let's jump right in. His when it was time to Cicero. nominate candidates for the consular election of 63 BCE, the conservatives in Rome were in a tough spot. Many of the older conservatives still had the stink of Sulla's reign of terror on them, which is mm. this whole can of worms that I'm not going to get into today. And the generation that had come of age after Sulla was still too young to be eligible for higher office. In desperation, the conservatives turned to this young senator from an unknown family named Marcus Tullius Cicero. Cicero was from a small town in central Italy and rose to prominence as a lawyer and later as a skilled administrator. Cicero was a citizen but like not Roman in the sense of being from the city of Rome, and everybody could tell. His detractors would call him a foreigner and an immigrant for most of his life. Supporting Cicero was a bit of a gamble for the conservatives. He had a reputation for being a constitutionalist and for being against corruption and bribery, but he yeah, during his time as an administrator, I believe in the south of Italy, uh, the south of the Italian peninsula, um, he'd really built up his reputation as a, a big anti-corruption uh, advocate, you know, a sort of stand-up guy. Um, you know, he'd built his base of support, but he'd also, you know, he was known as sort of playing it by the book. Um, that, that's sort of, you know, what he'd built his early reputation up to be. Um, and now he's getting a chance for a you know, more prominent uh, political career in Rome itself. He was still an outsider. Would he respect the Senate's prerogatives? What they didn't know at the time and what we know now is that Cicero favored stability and order and peace above all else. Yep. They had all lived through this painful civil war and Cicero believed that Rome's constitution was the best defense against another one. So the conservatives backed Cicero. It's not like they had much of a choice. The other two major candidates for consul that year were Catalina, aka Catiline, who was one of the leaders of the reform faction, and Antonius, the uncle of Marcus Antonius, aka Mark Antony, Caesar's mm. future right-hand man. Antonius was loosely aligned with the reformers, but in my opinion, just seemed like an ambitious idiot. More on him later. <laughs> Cicero didn't have a lot of money to spend on this campaign, so he did something as old as politics itself. He attacked the character of his two opponents. He was particularly brutal when it came to Catalina. He accused him of deliberately stealing from non-Romans during Sulla's dictatorship, which is just another way of saying, hey, non-Roman citizens, I'm one of you, vote for me. He Smart. constantly reminded voters that his opponents were complicit in the dictatorship, while Cicero had kept his hands clean. And even more, he accused both of them of being close friends with a young Julius Caesar, who was running for preacher that year and was already a very polarizing figure. Cicero also fought hard for the support of the wealthy business class. Some of the more radical reformers were making them nervous, and they were open to supporting someone like Cicero, promising stability. Yeah, um, and this is an early look at Cicero and Caesar, um, and obviously both would rise to be very prominent figures, and both would usually be on uh, opposite sides of conflicts. Um, you know, Cicero was... a conservative. He was about stability. Um, you know, his base was often the landed upper class, um, whereas Caesar would always play to the people. He was a populist. He was about reform. Um, and so they would often clash over these uh, ideas. Um, and, you know, these two sort of became some of the most prominent representatives of these two factions. Um, so we're sort of getting an early... <laughs> early look at that at the moment. And as Historia Seville has mentioned, Caesar is already uh, sort of a polarizing figure, and obviously <laughs> he would uh, remain polarizing throughout his life. <laughs> Cicero won in a landslide. Antonius came second, and he would serve as Cicero's co-consul. He was less strongly associated with Sulla than Catalina was, which I think explains his win. 
Mm. Catalina was understandably upset by his third place finish. He was arguably Rome's most prominent reformer. It was humiliating. He still had his seat in the Senate, but he immediately began preparing to run for consul again next year. When Cicero took office in January of 63 BCE, he did something so incredibly smart that I can't believe it didn't become common to practice. Oh. He was assigned one of the best provinces to govern after his term, Macedonia. He went to Antonius and was like, hey, you want a trade? They negotiated a deal. If Antonius stayed out of Cicero's way all year, he could have Cicero's province. This is mm. the last time you'll hear about Antonius in this video, but he was around just doing whatever Cicero told him to do. That is very smart. If you're in, if you're someone like Cicero, and this gives you sort of an idea of what Cicero wants, he's not necessarily in it for personal gain. Um, if he was, you know, he would have taken, uh, you know, one of the best provinces he could have been offered. He was in it for his own political success um, and everything that came along with that. So he's willing to give that up to maintain his political position. So if that's your goal, very smart choice. The first major problem to confront Cicero is something we're all familiar with now. Land reform. Yep. It was four years before Caesar's year as consul, and the land reform was still the perennial objective of the reformers. Cicero had no interest in bringing this issue up, but it was proposed by one of the new tribunes of the plebs. Cicero had to figure out how to deal with it. The actual bill was kind of similar to the land reform bills that Caesar would later pass, only mm. smaller in scope. A commission, 10 members this time, were to buy up land and redistribute it via lottery to the urban poor. In order to pay for this, the commission was authorized to sell publicly owned land in Italy and abroad. At the time, Cicero thought that Caesar was secretly behind this bill, but he had no proof. Based on the similarities between this bill and the one that Caesar would later pass, we can look back with some hindsight and say that, yeah, he was probably right. Cicero did everything he could to turn public opinion against this bill. He went around stirring up old fears, calling the Ten Commissioners the Ten Kings. He did his job, because the Senate voted down the bill and there was very little public backlash. And that's what someone like Cicero can do. You know, land reform was a massive issue in Rome at this time, and it was one of the biggest uh, talking points of the reformers of populists like Caesar, and it was a great way to pander to the public. Um, and I say pander, but there's a good argument to be made that land reform really was uh, necessary. Um, but if you wanted to gain public traction, you know, a good way to do that was to talk about land reform. And as Historius Phillips mentioned, Caesar would go on to uh, accomplish land reform uh, in his consulship. But, you know, Cicero was a great orator and was a skilled political operator. And in this instance, we can see that, you know, he sort of managed to keep land reform under wraps for a little bit longer. You know, it wouldn't be much longer until there was real land reform, but, you know, it shows you the skill of Cicero that he was sort of able to navigate around this uh, and avoid implementing this reform, which he didn't want because he was a conservative. Um, so, you know, it sort of gives you a look at, uh, at Cicero's skill. The downside of all of this is that the reformers now saw Cicero as an arch-conservative, which honestly he really wasn't. He was an institutionalist, and his problem with land reform was just that it was destabilizing. Yeah. Cicero may have been consul, but he was still a lawyer at heart. Mm. He spent a lot of time in the courts during his year, serving as the defense attorney in two major cases. The first was some really stupid case where some of the reformers accused a conservative senator of a murder 37 years ago. It was a big, stupid, politically motivated thing. The guy was innocent and everybody knew it. <laughs> Cicero saw it as his duty as consul to defend the senator. The case ended just as stupidly as it began, when Cicero and his allies deliberately caused a mistrial by using some arcane legal nonsense. The guy got off, but I mean, if you ask me, nobody really walked away from it looking particularly great. Right. Cicero's second legal case will come later, but first he had to oversee the elections for next year's consuls. Cicero learned from his intelligence network, or more accurately, I would say his wife's intelligence network, that Catalina, the guy who came in third last year and was a candidate again this year, was plotting a series of assassinations on election day. Mm. When election day came, Cicero openly wore body armor, something you weren't really supposed to do, and showed up with a gang of bodyguards. For whatever reason, maybe the assassins were intimidated by this show of force, violence was averted. 
Yeah, this sort of thing uh, will become is already becoming more and more common uh, in the late Roman Republic. Um, violence starts to be brought into politics, and then people have to defend themselves. Um, and you know, these are things. These are things that are a bad sign. Obviously, you know, if you have a peaceful political system, and then all of a sudden assassinations start taking place, and violence starts happening, and mobs and you know all that kind of stuff you have politicians uh walking around with increased security you know it's a sort of a, a bad sign for your democratic system and this is what was happening in the late republic violence is becoming more and more common and we can see this uh here just the fact that cicero felt the need to defend himself uh you know it's not not great Cicero oversaw the election of his two successors, and in a cruel twist of fate, Catalina came in third again. <laughs> Apparently, he pretty much bankrupted himself paying out bribes. He didn't have the means to run for consul a third time. Cicero's second legal case came up after the elections and was a lot more consequential. One of the mm. losers of the consular election was accusing one of the winners of bribery and wanted the results thrown out. This had the potential of being really destabilizing. Bribing people during elections was very illegal and very common. Yeah. Everybody did it. Cicero had even campaigned against bribery while his conservative backers continued to bribe everybody behind the scenes. It was inescapable. Cicero's logic was if we start throwing out election results because of bribery, every future election would be followed by a court case. He chose to lead the defense. And you know, this is true. It also shows you, you sort of got to deal with the cards you've been dealt. You know, Cicero was uh, explicitly anti-corruption. To what extent was he genuine? We don't know. But he was an anti-corruption guy. Yet in this instance, you know, he basically chose to defend corruption in order to defend stability. Because Historia Civilis is exactly right. Bribery was extremely common. Every single election, it was always happening. So... You know, I, I mean, if you wanted to, you could accuse anybody of bribery because um, it, it was always going on. So this is the case where Cicero has had to make a choice, and he's gone with uh, defending what he sees as stability and sort of the status quo, which is basically what he would always go for. As was mentioned, he's, you know, he wants to conserve stability and conserve the status quo. That's his, like, number one thing above basically everything else. Um even if in, the, in this case, it does, uh, in some sense, conflict with some of his anti-corruption principles. Cato, the arch-conservative, represented the prosecution. It got ugly. Cato went on and on about how corruption and bribery had seeped into Roman public life, which all happened to be true. Yep. Cicero responded by not addressing the facts of the case, because, again, the defendant was definitely guilty, and just <laughs> mocked Cato to his face. Wow. He called his philosophy silly. He called him unrealistic. He even made an obnoxious appeal to nationalism, saying something along the lines of, this isn't Greece. Here in Rome, things get messy, but things get done. Cicero <laughs> won the case, but ugh, gross. Yeah. After this, in a kind of symbolic gesture to prove that he wasn't pro-bribery, Cicero introduced and passed a law that increased the punishment for blatant bribery to up to 10 years of exile. Again, this was symbolic and more of a message to future candidates, saying, okay guys, pull back on the bribery a bit, it's getting out of control. Yeah. In October, after all of the turmoil with the elections was finally put to rest, Crassus, a senator from the reform faction, came to see Cicero. He showed Cicero a letter he had received, telling him of a secret plan to overthrow the government, masterminded by Catalina. Yep. Around the same time, Cicero started to hear reports of a small army mustering north of Rome. These two things had to be linked. Cicero presented his evidence to the Senate and placed Catalina under house arrest. This is a pretty big moment for Cicero and uh, one of the big moments of his career, but you know, I'll let Historia Civilis uh, go over it. As a precaution, the Senate passed a law called the Senatus Consultum Ultimum, aka the final decree or the final act, which empowered the consuls to do whatever was necessary to defend the Republic. Think of it as a form of martial law. Cicero's wife's spies learned that one night, Catalina slipped his guards and attended a meeting where, again, a plot was hatched to assassinate Cicero. 
After learning of this, Cicero put his home on lockdown, and his gang of bodyguards wouldn't let anybody through without the right password. Once again, you know, sort of some really bad uh, situations to be happening in your supposedly peaceful republic. Um, these are all very bad signs. <laughs> this seems pretty basic to us, but Roman homes were normally open to the public, and the act yeah. of giving a password like this was a well-known military tradition. Cicero basically transformed his home into a military encampment. The symbolism mm. wasn't lost on anybody. At the next meeting of the Senate, Cicero put forward a bill to banish Catalina. He was empowered to do whatever he deemed necessary under the final act, but he wanted to stay on the same side as the Senate. Unfortunately, nobody wanted to put themselves on the record against Catalina. Cicero, realizing that he had misread the room, quickly switched tactics and was like, okay, how about we banish this random other senator instead? The Senate was like, but you did nothing wrong. And Cicero was like, aha, so you admit Catalina did something wrong. <laughs> Not Cicero's finest moment. Yeah, this is Cicero's more uh, debate lordy side. He's like, ah, I've, tr I've truly got you now. And the Senate's like, what? What are you going on about? But, I mean, you know, it, it makes sense that he'd want to get the Senate's approval, despite the fact that he's empowered to do uh, basically whatever he wants, uh, you know, a form of martial law. Uh, we're going to see the effects of that uh, in a bit. In the end, he was right, though, because Catalina fled the city that night and joined up with the army in the north and declared himself the head of the new government in waiting. Yep. The situation was now on the precipice of civil war. Sometime later, one of Catalina's allies in the city went to a diplomat from a Gallic tribe visiting Rome and was like, hey, we're going to overthrow the government. Let's team up. The diplomat went directly to Cicero and reported <laughs> to him what had happened. Cicero was like, no, 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 go along with it. Now he had a spy on the inside of the conspiracy. The Gallic diplomat set up a big meeting with a bunch of conspirators to coordinate their plans. And when everybody showed up, Cicero was there with his bodyguards, and all of the traitors were arrested. Okay, Cicero nice. went before the Senate and said that he wanted these guys put to death. His argument was that the city was a powder keg, and they had no way of knowing how deep the conspiracy went. Mm. If they executed these leaders, it might be enough to put an end to the whole rebellion and avert a war. Remember, the Senate had already empowered Cicero to do whatever was necessary to keep the Republic safe, so he was not required to get the Senate's permission for any of this. But Cicero yeah. believed in the Senate, and he didn't want to go against their wishes. Both of the incoming consuls agreed with Cicero, put the prisoners to death. All of the ex-consuls agreed as well. So did all of the praetors. When it came time for the incoming praetors to weigh in, Julius Caesar rose to speak. Caesar argued that executing these men without a trial was an authoritarian thing to do, and it set a dangerous precedent for the future. Mm. He suggested that instead they should be sentenced to life imprisonment. This argument made Cicero suspicious. Remember, Caesar was friends with Catalina. How much was he involved in all of this? Another clash between Caesar and Cicero, and in this instance, you know, I can't help but really see what Caesar was saying, you know. Uh, this sort of execution without a trial. It is definitely an authoritarian move, which Cicero was empowered to make, um, and that a lot of the Senate was on board with, but even still, it's a dangerous, very dangerous move to make, and, you know, definitely runs the risk of setting a very bad precedent. But Caesar's appeal against authoritarianism was well received by the Senate, and a majority of them began to come around to his idea of imprisonment. After they heard speeches from all of the ex-preachers, ediles, ex-ediles, and questers, they finally got all the way down to the ex-questers, which was when Cato got to speak. Mm. Cato was only 32 years old at this time, but he was already cultivating one hell of a reputation. He chastised the Senate for putting the entire Republic at risk for the sake of their weak stomachs. Cato, for once in his life, urged them to be pragmatic. He argued that eliminating the threat and preserving the Republic was the highest priority. And if the Senate woke up tomorrow to find the city in flames, they would have nobody to blame but themselves. The mood in the Senate shifted yet again. Cato had convinced them. A vote was called, and the Senate voted in favor of executing the prisoners. Caesar went into a frenzy. He started screaming and launched himself at the opposition. His supporters tried to hold him back, and suddenly <laughs> everybody was on their feet as a bit of a fight broke out on the floor of the Senate. Oh, Cicero man. called for his bodyguards. They entered, swords drawn, and surrounded yep. the senators. 
I mean, just imagine this scene. I mean, one, it's just a crazy scene. Two, the note I've been hitting on throughout this video, that these are all really bad signs for your Republic. Once again, now you've basically had a scuffle, a fight, to some extent, break out in your Senate, and uh, it's been surrounded by armed guards. Like, this is really, really bad. And, I mean, it's kind of funny that here Caesar is arguing against authoritarianism, which I agree with, um, but, you know, give him a couple years, um, and of course Caesar will utilize some very authoritarian tactics himself. There was a tense standoff. After a beat, Caesar turned and stormed out of the Senate House. He would not return again while Cicero was consul. Mm. Let me pause here for a moment. Understand how shocking this was. Swords yeah. were forbidden inside the city of Rome, but at mm -hmm. some point, Cicero had secretly armed his men. Even more shocking was the fact that there was almost bloodshed on the floor of the Senate, and it was almost Caesar's blood. Let's just sit with that for a minute. Cicero left the Senate, followed by a horde of senators, and went to retrieve all of the prisoners from the homes where they were being locked up. He led them down to the Roman jail. Side note, I just learned this, the jail was actually an old converted cistern, like for holding water, so you could only enter it through the roof. Pretty cool. Hmm. Anyway, Cicero and the senators led the prisoners onto the roof of the jail. One by one, they tied nooses around their necks and had them yep. jump in. After the last conspirator was dead, Cicero turned to the crowd and announced what he had just done. When the rebel army to the north heard what had happened to their leaders, most of them fled. The Senate sent an army of their own to deal with them, and it was just a one-sided slaughter. Catalina and the rest of the leaders of the conspiracy died on the battlefield. So, I mean, this was obviously, this execution was quite a scene. Um, and, you know, I guess to a certain extent, it, it, it put down the conspiracy. It certainly did. Um, but this would remain sort of a black mark on Cicero's reputation. A very controversial move for years to come. You know, this would be remembered in a very controversial light and quite unfavorably um, throughout Cicero's career. Uh, and you can see why. I mean, this is a very controversial move to make. Um, not to mention, like, the arming of the guards and the surrounding of the Senate. This is all very much in violation of Roman tradition. Um, and is all, you know, we're tiptoeing around very dangerous territory. Um, that, I mean, you know, this sort of stuff would only escalate in the coming years, and, you know, eventually we get Caesar. <laughs> um, you know, so, the Republic is, uh, there are a lot of warning signs here for the health of the uh, institutions and traditions of the Republic. The Senate declared that for his actions, Cicero was to be honored with the title of Father of the Republic. <clears throat> At this point, Cicero's term was nearly over, but for his remaining days as consul, a crowd would follow him wherever he went, cheering and applauding. Cicero would consistently call this the proudest moment of his life. Hmm. All right. That was a great video. Um, you know, crowd cheering at the time. Everyone's jubilant. But like I mentioned, in the future, this would be seen as a much more controversial decision. That would uh, come back to haunt Cicero on some level. Um, but anyway, that was a great video. Like I mentioned, uh, I'm really glad we're getting into the late Republican period. Um, uh, and into perhaps the early Empire. Um, this is all really, really fascinating stuff. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed this one, because I certainly did. Um, you know, please stay tuned for more. Uh, subscribe, ring the, the notification bell, leave a like. Uh, check out the Patreon, all that good stuff. Uh, yeah, and I will see you guys again next time. I hope all you guys are having a good day, and goodbye.